in Blackboard. Right? I will be handing them back today and we will go over them as a group for the first half of the class. And then the second half of the class, we will continue on with our discussion of trees. Uh, first, we will have a <coughs> long discussion about exam number one. There is a wide variety of grades in exam number one. The distribution is summarized on the board. The maximum score was a 95. The median score was an 82. Right. However, there were a range of scores that covered just about this entire range here. You can split up these scores into three groups or so. Right, as I tried to impress upon you at the beginning of this class, this is a very difficult class, probably the most difficult class you've taken up to this point. And you'll need to put in a, insert a, a, a strong effort and to, to do well in this particular course. And if you received a B on this exam, great job. It's clear to me that you've been studying hard, that you've been doing the exercises that I've been asking you to do in the lectures, that you've been practicing the code, that you've been reviewing the notes, right, and trying to apply them to new problems, new exercises such as the one I mentioned during the lectures. All right, for those of you who received right, a failing grade, right, a D or an F, right, something has to change. And there is a decision before many of you, and some of, for some of you the decision is easy, for some of you the decision will be difficult. And given the previous drop rates for this class, right, from previous faculty, from previous years, Right, of this particular class, and given the scores of exam number one, I expect about five or ten of you to drop the class. <clears throat> For those of you who have a failing grade currently, it is important to know, and I must impress upon you, that you will get right, what you have earned in this class. Right, the highest score was a 95. There were eight A's on this exam. There will be no curve. <clears throat> If you were to continue with this class okay, and you continue to get failing grades, you will fail the class. Right? So there will be no grade inflation, there will be no extra curves, there will be no extra credit. Right? So for those of you in this category here, a very serious decision is before you. <coughs> Up to this point, we have this exam score and the project one score. I have reviewed the project one scores and graded about a third of them myself. I expect the project one scores to be lower than the exam one scores. <clears throat> right. For those of you up to this point who scored in here, there is no evidence presented to me at this point to suggest that you will succeed in the class. We have this one exam score to go off of. <clears throat> there are two choices. You can drop the class, right? or you can proceed with the class. Right. If you proceed with the class and you continue to get failing scores, you will get a failing score on your transcript. <clears throat> One definition of insanity right, is to perform the same task twice and expect a different result. <clears throat> if you decide to proceed with the class and you are in this category, something has to change. Something in the way that you're preparing for the exam, the way that you're studying, the amount of time, the amount of effort. Right, something has to change. Otherwise, you should expect the same result, and then you will fail the class. This class will demand a high amount of effort. <clears throat> if you do not have that time, if you do not have that effort, and if you don't have the desire, you may or may not want to proceed with the class. If you fall into this category, I will further suggest, strongly encourage, that you come visit with me and or your advisor to discuss and determine your best path forward. All right, for those of you in the middle here, perhaps teetering with the C, right, you have a, a tough decision in front of you, right, because the risk, the potential for getting a failing grade on your transcript if you were to continue is real. Right, however, given the forgiveness incorporated in this class, if you're able to change a few factors, turn things around, right, you could also recover fairly nicely. Right. So there is a decision, right? For those of you that might fall into this range, the decision is difficult <coughs> or potentially more difficult. <clears throat> All 
Institute. We will discuss the Project 1 scores and the Project 1 results on Thursday. Throughout this class, we are slowly removing some of the training wheels that you've been operating under right, throughout some of your previous programming classes. Right, one of the training wheels that we've removed right, in the first project was the design aspect of, of, uh, of programming. As you guys have learned, the design aspect is a non-trivial aspect of programming, programming quite possibly the most important. And as a result, project number one was fairly difficult for many of you who did not take the time during the design phase to draw up and sketch out proper designs. And instead, you in an ad hoc manner tried to program and design your code at once. It was quite clear who skipped the design phase when looking at your code and your grades for the design and for the overall project one submission will reflect that. It is important to note that moving forward, the programming projects will become more difficult. The concepts covered will become extremely more difficult. The concepts, the very basic structures that we've covered thus far, such as lists, arrays, dynamic arrays, trees, basic trees, are very simple compared to the structures we're going to keep covering from this point forward. So while you're making this decision, I encourage you to keep this in mind. The concepts covered, is going, are going to be more difficult. The projects are also going to be more difficult and that some more of the training wheels are going to be coming off. And if you cannot program or submit a program that runs to completion, right, you will not pass this class. And submitting a program right, that cannot process the standard input that is to be expected and crashes before completion and we'll be receiving a zero from this point forward. And there will be other constraints on your next two projects as well moving forward. Two of the questions, two of the generative questions where, where you were asked to, to code up a method or a structure that we have discussed in class were from exercises that I explicitly told you to practice in the notes and during the lectures. It is clear that over half of you neglected to heed this, right? neglected to practice the exercises that I suggested, right? and as a result, your grade one score reflects this lack of interest. The final exam will be more difficult than exam number one. Right? I'm not going to necessarily hint you the questions that will be on the exam. Right, as I did in this first exam. Removing an item from the beginning of a dynamic array was an exercise that I asked you to practice. Calculating the height of a tree was also an exercise I asked you to practice. And there's really no excuse for not getting 100% on both of those questions. And this course, right, is preparing you for a computer science curriculum, a computer science track. And at this point, you have taken two terms of program, programming language. You are expected to know a programming language. This is not a programming language class. If I have not done so yet, I want to impress upon you that the difficulty of this class is only going to be only going to increase. And so please take this into account while you're making your decision on your best path forward. Again, moving forward, this class is preparing you for a computer science curriculum. Right, the training wheels are coming off. <clears throat> Many aspects of programming that have been done for you at this point are now going to be removed, such as 
such as debugging your code. Right. Essentially, you're going to become a computer scientist or not. Right. You are you are birds in a nest, and it is time to fly. Right. You are slowly being nudged out of that nest. Nest. You are going to fly, and or you are going to crash and burn. Right. There is no way around it at this point. The curriculum is going to get much more difficult from this point forward. There's no easy way to transition you into this. Right. But the choice is completely and entirely yours. And right. again, if you are closer to this end of the spectrum, your probability, right, as you approach the zero side of the spectrum of not succeeding in this course and or dropping the course significantly increases the closer you get to zero. Right. The closer you are to 100, does not mean that you cannot fail the class, right? but your probability of failing the class is less. Right? In the middle, right? again, you're on the precipice. You can recover, right? or you can crash and burn. <clears throat> and we'll quickly review the exam, and then we'll dive into binary trees. John. Jordan. Is it over? Anna. Anna. Perhaps this is the problem. The This year. Sam, Hartman. <clears throat> Brittany. Graham. Sam. Sam. Brittany. We missed our brief discussion. A brief discussion. It might be that tough love. Silent. 
Does anyone not have an exam? <clears throat> All right, we'll briefly go over the exam. If you guys have any questions that we're going over, feel free to ask. I don't want to spend too much time on it because we still have a lot to cover before the end of the week. All right, project number two is going to be assigned at the end of the week. If you have lingering questions after we review this exam, feel free to come through during the office hours or if you have a, a question as we're going through it, just ask them. We will have another discussion like this, sadly, at the beginning of our lecture on Thursday, pertaining to project number one. All right, the first page of the exam was dedicated to complexity, complexity analysis, both time and space. In the first example, we had three embedded for loops. Each of the for loops is ranging from one to n. And the innermost statement is in the innermost loop. The innermost loop is going to execute itself. Itself, it's going to execute n times. Right? And since it's inside of an embedded loop, two of them, right? that particular for loop will execute n squared times. And so you get a total of n cubed. Right? The space complexity, right? the space complexity is constant. We just have one iterator i, one j, one k, <coughs> value sum, maybe one or two values for intermediate results of multiplication and division. And therefore, the number of memory buckets needed is about five or so, right? constant number. It does not depend on n and is not a function of n. In terms of n, it's big theta of one. Right, in our second case, right, we had a loop that would, <coughs> where our iterator was initialized to n, and we kept dividing n in half until it became less than one. And how many times can we divide a number in half? We have a number n, we can divide, divide it in half, right, log base two of n times. And we've done a few examples of this nature. And the time complexity there also is constant. And we just have the iterator i, and the value n itself does not depend on n or i. And the time complexity of the third example, and we had a recursive function that was according to the instructions, traversing a list of length n. And since this function is recursive, it will need you to open up and unfold on the runtime stack. Right. If there is n recurrences, that is, if this function calls itself n times, then there are going to be n stack frames allocated to this search function. Although there is a constant number of variables in each call of this function, there are going to be n instances of the scope on the stack, on the runtime stack, where the time and space is going to be big data of n. And the second section had to do with our discussion of data and data encoding. It's good to know about data. It is a data structure a class. We will be relying upon this data encoding right, and some of our upcoming methods right, in our upcoming discussions. Right? And previously and currently, we've learned how we can make some operations fast, relying upon the binary encoding of our data, right, such as doing multiplication by two, division by two, determining whether a number is even or odd. We can do these things very quickly. Right, because we understand how data is encoded in the machine. Right, data is encoded in, as a binary sequence of bits, and that's all I was looking for there. The binary representation of nine is one zero zero one. And right, if you want to multiply a number by two, all you need to do is shift the bits over to the left by one. And again, to visualize this. And if you have the number four, and you want to multiply by two, what's the result? Eight. And if you were to shift these bits over by one spot, you get exactly eight. Using a bit shift, using the bitwise operators is much faster for the ALU, much faster for the CPU as compared to multiplication operation, addition operation, essentially any other operation. Yes. Oh yeah, so some there is some confusion as to this. The first right, the first digit 
And the first digit is the sign bit. And if this number is, if this bit is zero, it is positive. If the bit is one, the value is interpreted to be negative. This is <coughs> by most basic and standard encoding. If the sign bit is zero, it means it's positive. If it's one, it's negative. Right. Furthermore, if the sign bit is one, this value would look very different as it would be in the choose complement representation of the binary number. And in order to do that, you add one and then flip all of the bits, thus resulting in the negative representation of the number in which you started with. All right, the next section had to do with uh, dynamic arrays and circular arrays. Right. The first question was a conceptual question. How are we able to put on the appearance of an array that can change size dynamically? I hinted to you that, of course, this, the fact that arrays are constrained by their contiguous allocation cannot actually be circumvented, but rather it is concealed with the dynamic array. We, in a sense, add a layer of abstraction over this underlying construct and give the appearance that it is able to change size dynamically. However, it cannot. How do we create a dynamic array abstraction? Right, I was looking for, there's essentially three steps I was looking for in this particular question. Right, you need to allocate a new array. Right, a larger one, you want to make room for the extra space, or for the extra item you might be adding. All right, the second is to copy items into the new array, so copy from old to new. Right. And the third one, you delete the old array. And question number four was one of the questions that I asked you guys to practice. And we went over an example very similar to this in class. The example we went over in class was to add an item to the front. Does that ring a bell? You added an item to the front of the dynamic array. So here you're simply asked to create a method to remove an item from the front of an array. And the array was assumed to be a dynamic circular array. The fact that it's dynamic is not relevant because you're removing an item. It's very unlikely that you need to make the array larger to remove an item. So we have a circular array. We have a front, our first item, our last item. Right. In the very simple case here, right, if we have uh, an item here and we want to remove it, all we need to do is bring in our first pointer by one, right, which is the increment. Right. There are a few special cases you needed to account for. Right. Right, there's, of course, the case where both the first and last are pointing to the same item. And here you would need to, you wouldn't necessarily have to, well, you, you want to keep track of the num items, right? <clears throat> the num items in this particular state could be zero or one, right? If it's, in either case, you don't necessarily need to update your first and last pointer, right? Some of you did and you had a, a you know, you assign them to a sensible value, which I think is a good idea. And that's fine. And, but what you, you would want to do at the very least is decrement num items, right? If you had a, uh, in the case of one item, right? in the case of zero items, there's nothing to be done, or you could throw an error. <clears throat> right, so those are two cases, case, case zero, where there's zero items in the list, case one, where there's one item in the list. Right? And the other case, you're going to increment first by one. Right? If first happens to be here, right? you can't increment it by one, right? so you have to either in this particular case, you have to account for it explicitly. If f is equal to n minus 1, right, then assign it to 0. Right? Otherwise, you could use the modulus function to catch all the cases and it would just simply wrap around for you. And the fourth question had to do with your project. If you did the project, if you got even partially through the project, if you had should have had no trouble with this particular question. Almost everyone got full points for this question. Right. 
the next section, section five, the tree. I mean, this section started off with a very uh, conceptual question that tried to probe your basic understanding of the tree structure. <coughs> right, I described the tree, and you were asked to illustrate it and formally define it using set and tuple notation. Right, the, the standard right, set and tuple notation for a tree is a tree can be represented as a tuple, a set of nodes, and a set of edges. You need to supply this. You need to simply can list the nodes. Right, as a set, and which is A, B, C, D, right out to G. Right, and the edges. And the edges in a rooted tree have implied direction, so you can indicate this using tuples. Right, so each edge is represented as a tuple, and therefore the set of edges is a set of tuples. Right, so for example, right, the edge that connects G to A right, is one tuple in the set. Right, the edge that connects G to B right, is another tuple in the set. Right, and then for every edge in the set, you would have a corresponding tuple. Or this is the parent, this is the child of the corresponding edge represented by that tuple. The root of the tree is G. The root has no ancestors. It has no parent nodes. Right, the leaves of the tree, these are all of the nodes that have no children. Right. There are four, F, B, D, and E. And these four nodes do not have any children. They are the leaves of the tree. Right, A has one descendant, and that is F. And question number seven was another question that I asked you to try as an exercise. <coughs> It is a simple recurrence, and I also hinted at the recurrence. Simple implementation application of a depth first search would get this done. I think someone got this done in three lines. How many of you have watched or heard of that, that game show, Name That Tune? I mean, a couple of you. Maybe some of you are older than, than I might expect. So in this game show, there are, there are people competing, right? and based on some hints that the game show host would give them about the artist of a particular song, right? they will then say that they can name the, the song right? after hearing only so many notes and notes. And then they'll sort of compete and barter over each other. Whoever can name it in the least number of notes will then be dared to do it. Right? And then if they can do it, then they get points, otherwise it's not. Here it's almost like a, you know, I can implement that function in two lines. Somebody tried to implement it in nine lines. Somebody was able to implement it in three lines. Right, that's great for writability, maybe not the best for readability, but nonetheless, it's worth mentioning. So, the height of a tree, how can we determine this? <clears throat> so, just conceptually speaking, how is the height of a tree related to the height of its subtrees? <clears throat> we can simply draw a, an example here. Right, so the height of a tree rooted out a particular node right, has what sort of relation to the height of its subtrees? This will be the interactive portion of the class. It's one plus the height of the subtree. Right. So the height of the tree rooted here right, is equal to the to one plus right, the maximum height of its subtrees. So the height of this tree, for example, would be two. Right, this is depth zero, depth one, depth two. Right. You guys wrote a program that said that this height was three, that's fine, as long as you're consistent. Right. It depends on whether you think these are, whether these nodes have length or not, or whether you think the edges have length. This was like endpoints here. Right. This was two, and this was three, and this was four. Right. Would you say that this is length two or three? Please. Either way, if you want to think that this height is three, you think it's two, either is fine. As long as you're consistent, as long as you came up with the correct recurrence or reasonably correct recurrence, right? You got four points for this. Right? So the height of this node is what? Well, it's one plus this, the, the height of each of these subtrees. <clears throat> the height of this subtree is essentially zero, and the height of this subtree is one. Right? So this one is the maximum, and this one has the largest height, so it's going to be one plus one. It's going to be two, the total height of the tree. 
Right? Note that this is a recurrent, so the height of the tree rooted here right, is going to be 1 plus the height of the tree rooted here, which is going to be 1 plus the height of the tree rooted here, or 1 plus the height of the rooted tree here, whichever is maximum. And right? again, in this recursive, in this recurrence, right, we can compute right, the height of a tree right, in terms of the height of its shoulder nodes, of the trees rooted at its shoulder nodes. And we'll go ahead and implement this quickly. Right, so we can have the height, right, we'll just say some tree rooted at roots here. Right, so this is going to be right, the height of the left and the height of the right. right so if root, we'll do the base case, if root is null, <coughs> right, we'll return right, minus one. And then or zero, depending on how you're counting. Right? If we have a tree with one node, right, its height is zero. So a tree with no nodes, we can say its height is negative one. Right? Otherwise, we want to take the, right, the the recurrence of the or the height, compute the height of the subtree. Right? So we can then simply return max of height. of root left child, who's going to do LC here, height right, of the roots right child, RC. Right. This value, plus one. Right. That's the three line implementation of, of this function. Right. All we need to do is compute the height of the left subtree. The height of the right subtree, determine which one is max, add one, and return up. Right, this is the recursive case, this is the base case. I encourage you to trace this through. This is a simple depth first search right, where we are computing the height of the tree on the way back up the recursive function call. Right, lastly, right, the last question right, required a bit of creativity and understanding of how memory is allocated. This was probably the, the only question that was maybe you know, quote unquote difficult. Right, it wasn't so difficult in that it required a bit of creativity. There are a number of solutions that you could have provided such that the result would not necessarily be an error, right? but more points were awarded for a more efficient solution. Right. In this particular question, you wanted to create a double stack. Right. Which consisted of conceptually two stacks. So here we'll have a concept of two stacks. We'll call this stack number one and stack number two. However, we have the added constraint, which is which would make which is what makes this problem non-trivial. Right? We have a constraint that we cannot use more than n memory buckets or n memory locations. So this is uh, difficult. There are uh, maybe three main categories of implementations that I saw. The first was simply to create two stacks, just like this. Right? However, of course, with your understanding of stacks, you realize that you have to, as soon as you create the stack, you have to give it a size and allocate it immediately. Right? So if this is the case, for example, you might say then S1 is going to be a new stack. Which you might implement as an array. And so I think most implementations, or some implementations I saw, I implemented these two stacks as two separate arrays. Right, the other number two. Right, so you have that. And that. Right, something, some pseudo code like this. Right. <coughs> right, this is not, it's not horrid in that it is, you can get the, you know, a correct result and it'll work often. 
right? However, of course, you're fixing the size here to be n over 2. So let's say that S2 only had one item. S1 was full, and you wanted to add a new item to S1. Well, in this particular implementation, you can't. So you're not efficiently making use of all of your memories and memory locations available to you. Right, does that make sense to everyone? Right, we have to, since we've implemented this as an array, these sizes are fixed. Right. So if S2 only had one item in it, and S1 was full, but we wanted to add an item to S1, we couldn't do it, even though we have, conceptually, enough memory locations to do it. Right, this implementation is restricted in that we cannot make that addition. Right. Some people implemented something like this, uh, but used a dynamic <coughs> thing, which, was, which was a good idea, and then you got a little bit more points for that. However, in implementing the dynamic array, you're going to need to allocate space to make the copy, right? in which case it is going to be possibly even further restricted than, than the, just using a simple array. Right. The second, of course, was using linked list. You could have a linked list, right? S1, the linked list, S2. Right. This is conceptually, I think, better than doing two stacks, as you do not need to know the size of each of these linked lists, right? and you can change the size dynamically. However, the downside of using a linked list is that you need to store that extra pointer. Right? Keeping track of that pointer, right, that conceptually counts against our memory buckets. And so in that sense, it does not allow us to maximally use our end memory location. Although you got a fair amount of points for a linked list implementation, as long as it was describable, and it is not the best we can do, but not bad. A, probably one of the most efficient ways to implement this was to, <coughs> to note that a stack can only be accessed at the top. Right? In a sense, the base is fixed. Right. And given this constraint, and given how we, an understanding of how we can allocate structures, lists, and memory, right, we can identify that it's only going to grow this way, and right, you're only going to grow this way. Right. Creatively, we can put this into one array of size n, where right. we would have the base of stack one here. Base of stack two here. And then somewhere we would have the top of stack two. Right? And the top of stack one. <coughs> that is, stack number one would grow in this direction, stack number two would grow in this direction. As long as we have an empty space in here to do a push on either one of the stacks, we are able to successfully complete that push. The only time we would not be successful if we have used all of our end memory locations. And so here we are making use of all of our memory locations for the actual data itself. There's no extra overhead for, for linked lists, such as the pointer, and there's no extra constraint in implementing these as two separate arrays, right, such as our fixed size of those two separate arrays. But given, given whatever implementation you went with, right, you got full credit on the, the question about implementing a push, as long as you did so and defined it in a reasonable way that was largely efficient, largely reasonable. Yes? Um, it wouldn't require a pointer to keep track of the top and the base, but wouldn't it require some sort of memory? Like yes, yes. so here we would have n over 2. Right? So this is not necessary. This is just simply 0. Right. Right? And this is not necessarily not necessary. It's just n over 1, or n minus 1, over n. Right. We also need two memory locations for these things. Right. And then for, so for those of you who kept track of this and counted this against the penalty of n here, right, then this would, this would be of size n minus 2. I gave full points whether you counted the members against the N or not. All right, let's take a quick break. I'll load up our, our binary tree discussion, and we will continue with our structures.
All right, guys, so in our previous discussion of trees, right, we noted that in our previous discussion of trees, we noted that the generic tree is rarely implemented. Uh, the unconstrained tree, where each node in the tree can have multiple children, is rarely implemented because its efficiency is generally poor. And so in practice, we generally implement constrained versions of trees. One constrained version is a binary tree. As we'll see here in our basic investigation of a binary tree, binary trees aren't necessarily the best we can do as far as efficiency as well. It is best to further constrain the trees. Right? Nonetheless, the binary tree provides a nice template for further trees, further constrained trees, and tree-like models. Right? And so we will briefly go over binary trees and discuss a simple application such as a binary search tree. Right. And a binary tree is just like our standard definition of a rooted tree, except we have the added restriction that each node has at most one child, or excuse me, two children. All right? By standard, we'll call it the left child and the right child. If we write it down on a piece of paper, one of them's going to have to be on the left or right, right, or top or bottom. Right? On our standard sketch or illustration of a tree, right, we will write out the children left or right. All right, so here we have an example of a binary tree. Right. At most, we have two children right, for each node. And right. the order of each node is two or less. Right. Some observations. By adding this one simple constraint, right, we've mitigated some of our allocation issues in our unconstrained tree structure. We could have a variable number of, of children at each node. And therefore, we had to either implement children as an array or as some sort of list, link, link list or some sort of list structure. Right? Uh, since the number might be variable, right, the, size of the, right, the size of that structure may not be known. Right? Here, we've constrained it to be two. Right? Therefore, we don't need a list structure. We can simply just have two attributes, two pointers, which will point to the left. One will point to the left child, and one will point to the right child. Right? So this mitigates the allocation issue of our, of our unconstrained tree. Right, so a few more attributes of a binary tree. Right, uh, maximum number of nodes of a binary tree, given that we know its height h, is constrained to be right, 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1. Right, given our definition of height, right, given the maximum depth of the tree, right, we can see that this is easily the, going to be the upper bound. Right, because here, we can bound the number of nodes at 2 to the depth. Right, we did this in a previous exercise with trees. Right, the number of the number of children right, at each level can double given each depth. Right? So for example, at depth zero, right, the number of nodes at that depth is one, two to the zero. Right? The number of nodes at depth one is two to the one, because we have two. Right? The number of nodes, the maximum that we could have at depth right, two would be two to the two, right, which would be four. Right? So to determine the maximum nodes in a tree, given that we know it's height h, we simply sum up the maximum number of nodes that there can be at each depth, and that maximum number comes to 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1. And in this case, we have 15. It's also important to note that, right, that this is a binary tree. 
And therefore, although we can also upper bound the maximum number of nodes, right, we also can lower bound the number of nodes in a tree given height h. Right? In fact, it will be h plus 1. Right? Given this wide range of possibilities of a tree given its height, right, the constraint of a binary tree is not as helpful as one might think. Right? The reasoning is because the binary tree might look like this, right? or the binary tree might look like this. <coughs> In terms of the number of nodes, right, if we were to traverse from this node to this node, right, how long would that traversal be in terms of the number of nodes in this tree? It would be n to traverse to the n, right, because we have four nodes to get to the bottom here. Right, we have to traverse all nodes. So to, to traverse right, from the root node to one of the leaf nodes, the, the leaf node in this example, right, it would be of order n to perform that traversal. Does that make sense? Okay. The reason here is that our binary tree has degenerated to a list, to traverse a list. It's order of big O of n, big beta of n. Right. The best case scenario with our binary tree is if we have right, 2 to the h plus 1 mi minus 1 nodes. Right. So if we were to traverse from A to one of the leaf nodes here, right, that traversal only takes log base 2 of n, where n is the number of nodes in this tree. And so this helps if we're searching for an item in the tree, and if we organize the items like, in the tree in an appropriate manner, as we'll see with our binary search tree in just a bit. Um, yes? You said that it takes um, log n to get through the uh, node? Correct. Right. So you get from the root node to any one of the leaf nodes. And if we have a, a tree, that has its full complement of child nodes, right? <clears throat> this would be the best case in terms of the, the number of nodes for a traversal. Yeah. So what, why, I'm confused why the whole tree has less complexity than just a list. Right, so this particular comparison is not necessarily even in terms of the number of nodes. The number of nodes in this tree, N, is not the same as the number of nodes in this tree. Right. If the number of nodes in this tree was the same as the number of nodes in this tree, right, and we just strung them out sequentially, then we'd have a length of 15. Right? And in order to traverse that list, essentially, which our tree has degenerated to, we would have to traverse all 15 of the nodes. Right? Whereas if we were to organize them in a branching fashion, in a tree-like fashion, right, we could potentially get from the root node to a leaf node much more quickly in terms of the number of nodes. I note that our traversal schemes for a binary tree is very similar to the traversal schemes for a standard tree. It's just simplified in that we don't have a variable number of children at each node. Right? We need only check right? or traverse down to the left child and the right child. So if we're doing a depth first search, right? rather than having a for loop for each child of our root, we can just simply perform the depth first search on the left child perform the depth of our search on the right child, <coughs> and then we have our base case. Right. Note here, right, we have a pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversals. Right. The pre-order means that you're going to process that particular node here. So before traversing to its children, you will process that node, whatever the processing is, if you're going to print out the value, if you're going to manipulate the data, if you're going to retrieve the data, whatever it is you're doing in this traversal, I imagine you're not traversing, right? We're not gonna traverse the tree for fun. You wanna perform a task. Whatever that task is, you're gonna perform here before you traverse down to the children in a pre-order traversal. In-order traversal means you visit your le left subtrees first, right? So you will visit the left child first and then process right? the root node in this particular recursive scheme. And a post-order traversal, right? You only process this node, right? After you process all of its children, all of its descendants. And of course, we can also perform this iteratively like using a like using a stack-like structure. Right, similarly, we can perform a breadth-first or a level order traversal of our binary tree. Similarly, all we need to do is replace our looping structure to loop over all the children. We can simply perform the tasks explicitly for the left child and the right child. 
And so if we're going to implement this iteratively, right, which is intuitive, right, uh, we would create a queue, add the root, and then continue with our breadth first search, adding the children, just the left and the right. We don't need to iterate over all the children. We just have the two. <coughs> or we could implement it recursively. Again, implementing a breadth first search recursively is unintuitive. Right? We need to keep track of this queue, right? so we're going to have to pass it from scope to scope, or, the, or you would have to implement it as a global variable. It's unclear which is worse, but either of these are not very good. Right? A little bit more intuitive, more befitting to implement a breadth-first search iteratively using a queue. Given our added constraint of the binary tree, we have some different implementation options, maybe some that weren't necessarily available to us when we had an unconstrained tree. Right? The most common way to implement a binary tree, or at least maybe the most intuitive way, would just simply be to implement it very much like a chaining structure, right? like a linked list, but instead of each node having just the next field, you would have a left child field and a right child field, thus allowing your chain to branch. Right, in the two directions of your binary tree. Right, so each node entity might have a data attribute where you're storing the data or the key that is to be stored at that particular node. Right, and then you would have two attributes accounting for the two children at that particular node. <coughs> if we know a little bit about our tree, right, such as the height of the tree, right, we could implement this using an array. Right, given that we know and that we have a constraint imposed on the number of children at each node, we know that if we know the height, that the maximum number of nodes is 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1. So we could, conceptually, implement this as an array because we know the maximum number of nodes. We can allocate that space, right? and we can store the nodes in some sort of intuitive scheme. Right? The most common way to do so would be to store it in a breadth-first scan. Right? So in this particular example, a breadth first scan of this tree, right? Can you guys see this tree down there? Keep drawing. Allocating this contiguously in memory right, allows us to uh, allows us to index each of these items directly, potentially if we know what we're looking for. Right, the pro con trade off of an array implementation is generally there's more cons than pros as it's highly restricted. Right, but given that we know that we can constrain the number of nodes based on the height, it is a it is an option right, depending on your application. Right, so here we know that the first right that's the first step. We can only have, or depth zero, we can have one node, like the root node. Right? So we can allocate one space in memory for that. At the next step, we know that we can have two to the depth, right? in general, two to the depth. So at the next step, we can have two nodes. Right? Right? At the next step, we know that we can have four nodes, right? and so on and so forth. We know the maximum number of nodes that, that we could possibly have in our tree if we know the height of the tree. And so an intuitive way to store this information in the array would be to perform a breadth first scan. Right? That is, you could put the, all the items in uh, depth zero, followed by all the items at depth one, <coughs> followed by all the items. You know that it's all the potential items right, at each of these depths. Because we may want to, for example, add C's left child here. And we may want to add F's right child. Right? And we want to account for the ability to fill out the height of this tree. Right. And of course, keep in mind the actual orientation of the tree. All right, so in a breadth first scan, we would have right, A, B, C, D, right, E. And then here we would have C's left child. And so we want to leave a spot for that. All right, then C's right child goes to F. Right, and then here, we just have one node at this very last step. Right? It's also the depth in which we have the most number of potential nodes. And so there's a lot of empty spaces here. So D's left child would then come next. And then D's right child. And then E's left, E's right. And then if C had a left child, 
right? It's left and right child with income, right? And then F's left child and then F's right child. And so here you can allocate an intuitive way to do it would be a breath first scan. And there's clear downside to performing this array implementation. One is not necessarily efficient. Right? We can see all of the empty spaces we're storing here, right? The number of nodes in the tree is not near its maximum, not a very efficient implementation. Right? In many instances, we're not necessarily going to know the height of the tree a priori or during allocation time either. Right? So that's another pretty, pretty hefty constraint. Right? And the size of the tree can't really change dynamically. Otherwise, if we had to increase the size or the height of this tree, right, we would have to implement something similar to a dynamic array where we have to create a new array, larger size, copy all the items over, right? and, and then continue. Right, so this might be a, a reasonable solution in a very niche application of a binary tree where we know the height of the tree prior right, to, to use of the tree right, so that we can allocate it all at once and the height of the tree is not necessarily going to change. Question? In this specific example, um, for node G, um, what is specifically indicating that it is a left node rather than a right node? Is it like a data member or because when there's only one child in a binary tree? It depends on the application of the tree and what you're using the tree for. If there's no rule that differentiates the left child from the right child, then potentially it could be either, in which case you can store it in either. And in most applications of binary tree, there's a restriction imposed on left and right children, as we'll see when you look at the binary search tree. Right, the restriction is that each data member in the left child of a particular node is going to be less than the data stored at its parent node, and the data member of a right child is going to be greater than the value stored at its parent node. Right. Imposing this order is going to bring us uh, some efficiency, right, just as it did when we ordered a list. And when you order a list, and you want to search through the list, or right, you want to order a binary search, right, given that extra information that the data in the list is sorted, it allows us to traverse the list very quickly. Right? And we get, the sim we get the same gain here with the binary tree. Right? Uh, and so most uses of a binary tree will impose some sort of order. So there's, it's important to differentiate between the children, but maybe not all applications. Good, good question. <clears throat> all right, so as as we had some common operations on a very generic tree, we have common operations on a basic tree, right? Uh, or on a binary tree. A binary tree, we may want to copy the tree and create a new tree. We might want to deallocate or delete a tree, right? We might want to determine the height, count the number of nodes in the tree. We might want to insert an item into the tree, right? and we might want to remove an item from the tree as well. So we'll look at a few of these examples. Right? And of course, we might want to search for a particular item in the tree. And it's important to note for all data structures, again, I hope I've embedded this in your minds, it's important to note that generally given the data structure, we have some sort of constraint on the data structure, such as maybe the ordering constraint and the binary switch tree. Right? This is important for us to understand the structure and use the structure correctly. And therefore, when you're implementing methods and operations for the structure, it's important that you confirm that the structure is indeed valid after the operation. Right? So you want to make sure that after you perform in addition, like you did in your polynomial example, right, that the result of the addition operator was a valid polynomial at the back end. Right, so you always want to check the validity of your data structure. Right? Theoretically, you want to check it before and after. Assuming that your, your data structure is in a valid state before an operation is applied to it, right, you certainly would want to confirm that the output of that operation is going to be result in a valid data structure as well if you're manipulating, changing, or creating a new one of those structures. Right. And so here is a slide that we've seen before, and this slide should give us some intuition as to the utility of a binary tree. Right. We use this tree-like structure to illustrate the process of performing binary search with a linear structure. And in fact, performing binary search, if we have a list of items that are in some sort of ascending or descending order, Performing binary search on that linear structure is analogous to performing a search in a binary search tree. Right? The idea here is that we're going to impo impose order in our binary search tree. And using that order, we're able to 
divide our list in half or divide our tree in half, ignore half of it and proceed down to another end of the, the tree. And so in our, in our list-like structure, right, we had a list like this. Right? Our tree structure here is visualizing how we use that divide and conquer-like approach to implement binary search. Right? So if we search for an item in binary search, we jump to the middle of our list. Right? We check the value of the item in the middle of our list. If the item we're looking for is left than the, less than the middle item, right, then we know that we could just continue the search in the left half of the list. We wouldn't need to look in the right half. Thus, we are able to eliminate half of the list, improving efficiency quite a bit. Right? Similarly, if the value we were looking for was greater than the value in the middle of the list, then we know that we only had to check in the right half of the list. So just ringing the bell. Yeah. Right. So note here that we can visualize this procedure of binary search using a binary tree. Right? That is, starting here at the root node, we have an entire list that we need to search. By checking the middle item, we're in a sense dividing this list in half and continuing our search in one half of the list, but ignoring, completely ignoring the other half of the list. We don't need to waste our time. Right? We don't need to waste our computational steps on that other half. So for example, if the item we were looking for is going to be in the left half of the list, that is, it's less than the middle value, right? that's analogous to proceeding down to the left child in this tree. Right? That is, we don't have to search this half of the list at all. And so what do we do at this point? Well, at this point, we have half of the list. Right? We don't want to just sequentially search that half of the list now because sequential search is slow. So we perform the same action. We'll divide this list in half again. Right? And we will iteratively or recursively, however you want to think of it, divide this list in half using this scheme, eliminating the left half or the right half and proceeding. Right? We divide this list in half at each epoch of this iteration or at each epoch of this recurrence. Right? We will get a path that goes from the root node to a leaf node that is going to be bounded by log base two of n, where n is the size of our list. Ring the bell? It's good. All right. All right. So note that tracing out this tree is very intuitive because it's actually very intuitive to implement the structure as a tree rather than a sorted list. All right. And in fact, if we had a list just like this, we could implement it as a binary search tree just like this. Right, in a list-like structure, right, if we knew that it was sorted in binary search, we would jump to the middle item here. Right, let's say we were looking for 50, let's say. We would jump to the middle item here, right, which would be 10. Right? And we know that 50 is greater than 10, so then we would eliminate the left half and jump to the right half of this list. That's analogous to starting at the root of this corresponding tree, looking at the value 10, and determining whether 50 is greater than 10 or less than 10. If it's greater than 10, then we can go to the right child. If it's less than 10, then we should go to the left child. Thus, we can facilitate this binary search by explicitly traversing this binary search tree. Right? So how do we construct a binary search tree? Well, the binary search tree is a binary tr tree with the extra added condition. Right? <clears throat> That's the value Right, of the left subtree, or all the values in the left subtree, right, are less than right, the value of each node. Right, or let's say the, <clears throat> the values right, in the left subtree of a particular node are less than the value at that particular node, and the values in the right subtree of a particular node are greater than the value at that particular node. The value or data member stored in a tree, right, you can think of it as a data member Right. Often, in, in the context of trees, we will generally refer to it as a key. Right. You can refer to it as a key or a data member. Key has that added implication of the value being unique. You guys remember the discussion of keys within the context of databases, maybe within your math methods course. And the key in the database is right, an item that can uniquely identify right, each item in the database. And so here, we'll assume that the, each data member is going to be unique right, in uh, the tree. Right, so we will refer to them as keys, right, at least it's standard to do so. All right, note again, we get a similar traversal as performing binary search on a sorted linear structure, right, as we do by performing a standard traversal down uh, from our root to a leaf node in a binary search tree.
Yes. Do you mind repeating what you said about the key when we're talking? Yeah, so the data member in each of these nodes within a context of a, of a tree is generally referred to as a key. It's just a nomenclature thing. One potential added implication with using key over just simply data is that a key in many contexts implies that that particular data member will, that particular value will uniquely identify you know, an entry in that particular node. So the key should be a value such that there are no repeats of the key in the tree. Right, that's another way of saying it. Yes. Another way of saying it is the key performs a is a one-to-one -one correspondence with each of the nodes in the tree. It's a one-to-one -one and onto mapping from the key values to each of the nodes. All right, so how would we perform this search? Well, the, the search scheme for searching a binary tree is very much like our search scheme for binary search of a list. Right? At least the structure is similar. Right? However, then divide, instead of dividing our list explicitly in half by changing values of indexes and or pointers of the list, right? we can, <clears throat> this, this divide in half is sort of already built inside of our tree here. For example, if we were at this root node and we traverse down to the left child, right? that's like dividing our list in half and ignoring the subtree rooted at the right child. So the sense of dividing this, this structure in half, it's already built into our tree. Right? Thus, we can start our search at the root node. We will proceed down to the leaf nodes. Note that this is going to be very similar to a depth first search as we're simply proceeding down the tree. Right? However, right, we have no need to backtrack up the tree. Right? So we don't have to full perform a full depth first search. Right? That is, we shouldn't have to traverse all of the nodes in the tree, but rather just one path starting at the root Worst case, we have to go all the way down to the leaf. Best case, we might find it on the way. A right, better case, we find it on the way. All right, so our scheme, right, again, since we don't have to backtrack or go back up the tree and search other branches that we might have passed over, right, we don't need to. Right, we don't need to implement a stack to perform this traversal. We don't necessarily need to implement it recursively either, right, but you certainly can. Right. Instead, we can start at the root node. Right, and then iterate. So if the item we're looking for, let's say we're looking for item I, let's say that that item I is stored as in one of the keys or in the key attribute for the for the nodes in the tree. Right, we can simply just traverse the list as follows. If the item we're looking for is greater than the key stored at this node, right, then we'll go to the right subtree. Right. We can get that done by just simply changing our iterator value. Our iterator starts at the root. Right here, we will change it to go down to the right child. Right, if the value we're looking for is less right, than the value stored at this node, right, then we'll assume we'll go to the left tree. Right, we can get that done by changing our iterator node to go to the left child. Right, otherwise, right, if it's not greater than or less than, you can assume it's equal, possibly. You might want to have an extra else case for an error, in case something really wacky happens. <clears throat> And then, of course, if it's the item you're looking for, then we would return either, yes, we found the item, or return a pointer to that node, or the data, whatever it is you want to do, right? uh, whatever it is you're trying to retrieve. All right, otherwise, right, if we get to a null node, we break out of this loop, we can have some sort of case for that as well, indicating we didn't find what we were looking for. We have a big tree. Isn't the efficiency going to be list than if we had just a long list because we can't skip any notes. Like I'm thinking that like in the example that we just did, you look in the middle and then if you create a better list then you go to one half and then you can skip to the middle again. But you can't skip any notes in that tree. You have to process every node so <clears throat> not necessarily process every node. Right, so the idea of skipping is a little bit different, though conceptually it's the same. Right, uh, there is a caveat that you are that you are you know on the precipice of of identifying which which can make a binary search tree not necessarily as efficient as doing a uh, binary search on a list. Right, <clears throat> but here, for example, if we were to jump to the middle of this list here, ten, we can ignore searching all of these items. Right, if the item we're looking for is less than ten, for example. Right. So if this in the same in the same 
uh, context here, if we were searching for something in this tree for an item less than 10, we can traverse down to the left child, thus ignoring these three items here, just as we ignored those three items here. Right? And so this way we can continue right, in our traversal down the tree. And since we don't have to backtrack, and since we never have to do a full traversal of the tree, right, the worst case right, of each of these right, should be the same, right, given an extra constraint on this tree structure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes? So is the key link an index stage? The key is essentially just the, the data or some subset of the data stored at each node. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like the 10 in the first node? Yeah, it could be the 10. Oh. Yeah. yeah, the data stored up in them. Yeah. What does happen if you have like data with just uh, two data points with like the same value? It's, depending on your application, you'll have to make a decision. In most, in most applications of, of trees of this nature, right, you're, you're assuming that there aren't going to be any repeats. If there is an exact repeat, or let's say there is a field where there might be a repeat, then maybe that field's not the best key. Maybe we should choose a different key. Right? So if these are entries of, let's say, records of persons, students, for example, it might consist of a student name, student ID, uh, maybe a few other things, right? right? Using the key, right? making the key the first name would be a terrible key, right? right? Because that, if you were simply searching by first name, you could essentially go to many, many nodes of students that might have the first name. And so it wouldn't uniquely identify the record you're looking for. Right? So if you have repeats of a key, right, then you should probably change what your key is in most instances. In some odd situation where you might be, where you might have repeats of actual entire records that you're storing, like all of the data is a complete repeat, it's unclear where you would actually want to store that as two different entities unless you were doing some sort of frequency analysis. So doing some sort of frequency analysis, you probably wouldn't want to do a tree. Just something going off that. So let's say um, you have like a set of data, and let's say like your students. And for example, you set decide okay, my key is just going to be a unique ID that I assign to it, but like something maybe you do database or so. Mm -hmm. And then so then I, I have this binary tree, but let's say I want to find like a student based on last name. How would would this structure necessarily work? Because I'm traversing through the size of the ID that I got. So that that. You could be neglecting basically half of the, the, the half of the tree, but that user doesn't need it. Yeah. So, so for, from an implementation perspective, when you choose your key, you're limited to using that key field as the search parameter to search the tree. At least if you want to do it efficiently. So, uh, ways around that is you could have like a Cartesian product with multiple fields um, <laughs> that you can use to search, um, or you could have multiple trees of different things actually implemented. Binary search trees for different keys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything that you can put in order. So how do you, you order the strip? Would you like order them by like alphabetical order? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. We're done. I'll see you guys uh, Thursday. We'll talk about project one. <clears throat> Again, for those of you who did not do well on the first exam did not do well on the first projects, I encourage you to speak with me and or your advisor as there are some tough decisions that you make. Um, I noticed that in Blackboard, my project one grade changed. Um, I just wanted to confirm that it was like put in wrong the first time. Yeah, I believe. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, they're uh, they're in a state of flux. I generally will start grading and keep notes, and I do it in black books. I suppose I can make it not flux. That way, it's less confusing. Uh, but I went back through and, and made some updates to the grading scheme. And okay. The okay. So the current grade is. Yeah, they're you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many projects will there be for the class? There will be three projects. The next project will be assigned at the end of the week. It'll be based on traits. Right? And the third project will probably be assigned in about three weeks or so. It's, the design of the next few projects will not be as difficult as the first, as the design was a really big portion of it. We'll be implementing some basic tree structures. 
in the in your second project. Oh, you have to scroll down. And so I'm I'm assuming that it'll only take about two two and a half weeks. Next project. All right, great. Thank you. Oh, okay. yeah. So. Um, I. Oh, so I realized for my grade for the first assignment, I didn't put my cover letter in a different file. I didn't realize that. So that's what's good. So it's actually in the top of my function. Oh, you commented it out on the very top. In the comments. So I meant I, I I can email you if that'll help you remember. Yeah. 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 You get that and that might. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I will. I will check it out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's a question about the computer hardware. Okay. Hardware check. 